their guilty stains. And sinners punch beneath that flood. my wife Sarah and I moved into our home here in Gibson City, we were woefully unprepared for what we were about to embark on. We knew that owning a home for the first time would involve lots of responsibilities, but I don't think we realized the seemingly endless supply of tasks that would need to be done around the house. Whether it was an area to clean, something to buy, a repair to make, there was always something looming around the corner. And I found that I was, as I was in a new house, without the skills needed to do these tasks, there were all sorts of things that came at me from all sorts of different sides, things that I was simply unable to do. I couldn't replace the broken window. I didn't know how to open up the swimming pool to start the season. I didn't know how to install the new faucet at the kitchen sink. On and on the list went. And gradually, we spent more time, and I learned how to do things, hired some people to do others. But gradually, even as we spent more and more time, I realized something unexpected. 
it seemed like no matter, no matter how many times I completed a task or fixed something or did a project, there was always something else looming around the corner. I had never thought about the way that regular wear and tear on a house makes its mark on the places that we live. And though I learned the skills and did things over and over, it was never going to be done. Always needing something else again and again. As I read stories we see in our scriptures, I wonder if some of the people we read about may have felt similarly. In the Old Testament, we read stories about the priests and the sacrifices they were to make on behalf of the people. A whole tribe of people, the Levites, were tasked with making sacrifices to God on behalf of the people, sacrificing animals day after day. And it wasn't as if these animals were some magic formula to gain God's favor, but they were a reminder of the sin and brokenness in people's lives. A reminder that sin, rebellion against the God who's created all things, is a serious matter. This was their task, day after day. And it was a worthy task, one that was honorable for the people that were doing it, but it didn't actually provide for the people forever. This is something we see discussed in the book of Hebrews in chapter 10, where, as the author to Hebrews says in verse 11, every priest stands day after day at his service, offering again and again the same sacrifices that can never take away sins. See, while these sacrifices were important, they reminded people of the seriousness of what was happening, they couldn't actually remove the sins completely, and they couldn't prevent people from sinning again in the future. But there's another sacrifice that's different, and that's what the author of Hebrews is emphasizing here. He goes on in verse 12, and he says, But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God and since then has been waiting until his enemies would be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us. For after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any sacrifice for sin. Jesus provided a sacrifice unlike any other that those priests had made day after day. Those were meaningful, but they had to be completed over and over. But it was in Jesus' sacrifice that ultimate hope and redemption could be found. Lasting forgiveness and love. His sacrifice is completely unique. And Good Friday is a day for us to remember that sacrifice. And in it, we're also reminded of our inability to do certain things for ourselves. We can't have a priest sacrifice something for us to bring us into right relationship with God. We can't muster up enough strength, try as we might. But instead, we're dependent upon the sacrifice that's been made on our behalf. The sacrifice that's been made by Jesus. In this time of year and in this week, it's easy for us to look ahead to Easter and to think about the celebration that awaits us in just a couple days. But tonight, we pause. And though we won't ever be able to bring ourselves into right relationship with God, and though I'll never be able to come across some foolproof trick to solve all of my house repairs for once once and for all, when it comes to our sacrifices before God, we can be confident in the sacrifice that's made on our behalf. 
And tonight we remember that sacrifice and we participate in the hope and the glory that come as a result of the great sacrifice that's been made for us on Good Friday. I've been asked to read a prayer that comes from a collection of Puritan prayers in a book entitled The Valley of Vision. This particular prayer is called The Precious Blood. Blessed Lord Jesus, before thy cross I kneel and see the heinousness of my sin, my iniquity that caused thee to be made a curse the evil that excites the severity of divine wrath. Show me the enormity of my guilt by the crown of thorns, the pierced hands and feet, the bruised body, the dying cries. Thy blood is the blood of incarnate God. Its worth is infinite. Its value is beyond all thought. Infinite must be the evil and guilt that demands such a price. Sin is my malady, my monster, my foe, my viper, born in my birth, alive in my life, strong in my character, dominating my faculties, following me as a shadow. Intermingling with my every thought, my chain that holds me captive, in the empire of my soul. Sinner that I am, why should the sun give me light? Why should the air supply me breath? The earth bear my tread, its fruits nourish me, its creatures subserve my ends, yet thy compassions yearn over me. Thy heart hastens to my rescue, thy love endured my curse, thy mercy bore my deserved stripes. Let me walk humbly in the lowest depths of humiliation, bathed in thy blood, tender of conscience, triumphing gloriously as an heir of thy salvation. Amen. Let's stand as we sing together. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the prince of glory tie my richest gain I by count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride and see from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingle down. Did there such love and sorrow?
This is from uh, J.B. Phillips' translation. The moment daylight came, the chief priests called together a meeting of elders, scribes, and members of the whole council, bound Jesus and took him off and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him straight out, well, you, uh, are you the king of the Jews? Yes, I am, he replied. The chief priests brought many accusations. So Pilate questioned him again. Have you nothing to say? Listen to all their accusations. But Jesus made no further answer to Pilate's astonishment. Now, it was Pilate's custom at festival time to release a prisoner, anyone they asked for. There was in prison at that time with some other rioters who had committed murder in, re in a recent outbreak, a man named Barabbas. <clears throat> the crowd surged forward and began to demand that Pilate should do what he usually did for them. So he spoke to them. Do you want me to set free the king of the Jews for you? For he knew perfectly well that the chief priests had handed Jesus over to him through sheer malice. But the chief priests worked upon the crowd to get them to demand Barabbas' release instead. So Pilate addressed them once more. Then what am I to do with the man whom you call the king of the Jews? They shouted back, crucify him. But Pilate replied, why? What crime has he committed? But their voices rose to a roar, crucify him. And as Pilate wanted to satisfy the crowd, he set Barabbas free for them. And after having Jesus flogged, handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers marched him away inside the courtyard of the governor's residence and called their whole company together. They dressed Jesus in a purple robe and twisting some thorn twigs into a crown, they put it on his head. Then they began to greet him. Hail your majesty, king of the Jews. They hit him on the head with a stick and spat at him and then bowed low before him on bended knee. And when they had finished their fun with him, they took off the purple cloak and dressed him again in his own clothes. Then they led him outside to crucify him. They compelled Simon, a native of Cyrene in Africa, who was on his way from the fields at the time, to carry Jesus' cross. They took him to a place called Golgotha, which means Skull Hill, and they offered him some, some drugged wine, but he would not take it. Then they crucified him and shared out his garments, drawing lots to see what each of them would get. It was about nine o'clock in the morning when they nailed him to the cross. Over his head, the placard of his crime read, The King of the Jews. They also crucified two bandits at the same time, one on each side of him. And the passers-by jeered at him, shaking their heads in mockery, saying, Hi, you! You could destroy the temple and build it up again in three days. Why not come down from the cross and save yourself? The chief priests also made fun of him among themselves and the scribes and said, He saved others. He cannot save himself. If only this Christ, the King of Israel, would come down now from the cross, we could see it and believe. And even the men who were crucified with him hurled abuse at him. At midday, darkness spread over the whole countryside and lasted until three o'clock in the afternoon. And at three o'clock, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of the bystanders heard these words which Jesus spoke in Aramaic, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, 
and said, listen, he's calling for Elijah. One man ran off and soaked a sponge in vinegar, put it on a stick and held it up for Jesus to drink, calling out, let him alone. Let's see if Elijah will come and take him down. But Jesus let out a great cry and died. The curtain of the temple sanctuary was split in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood in front of Jesus saw how he had died, he said, this man was certainly a son of God. There were some women there looking on from a distance, among them Mary of Magdala, Mary the mother of the younger James and Joseph and Salome. These were the women who used to follow Jesus as he went about in Galilee and look after him. And there were many other women who had come up to Jerusalem with them. When evening came, because it was the day of preparation, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph from Arimathea, a distinguished member of the council who himself prepared to accept the kingdom of God, went boldly into Pilate's presence and asked for the body of Jesus. And he sent for the centurion and asked whether he had been dead long. On hearing the centurion's report, he gave Joseph the body of Jesus. So Joseph brought a linen winding net, winding sheet, and took Jesus down and wrapped him in it, and then put him in a tomb which had been hewn out of the solid rock. Rolling a stone over the entrance to it, Mary of Magdala and Mary, the mother of Joseph, were looking on and saw where he was laid. Stay, Christ on the road to Calvary, tried by sinful men, torn and beaten there, nailed to a cross of wood. There's the power of the cross. Christ became sin for us. He took the blame and bore the wrath. We stand forgiven at the cross. Told to see the pain. Written on your face, bearing the awesome weight of sin. Every bitter thought and every evil deed, crowning your blood stained brow. And now the daylight flees. How the ground beneath quakes as its maker bows his head. Blood torn in two, the dead are raised to life. Finish the See my 
name written in the wounds for through your suffering I am free death is crushed to death and life is mine to live one through your selfless love this the power of the cross son of god slain for us oh what a love and what a cost we stand forgiven at the cross as we sing together.
Communion is a way in which we come together as the body of Christ and remember what the Lord Jesus has done on our behalf. This evening we are not going to do communion the way we have done it for the last few years on Good Friday. We're going to do it collectively, but even in that we're going to do it just a wee bit different. There are two tables set up, um, one to my right and to my left. In the center of that table, there's a loaf of bread that's been broken. Uh, those of you who are comfortable enough, uh, we invite you to take a piece of that bread and uh, you can be seated after doing that. If you don't want to take that bread in particular, the cups are provided that have both the bread and the juice in them. Uh, after you have taken uh, the bread or that uh, cup and juice, please be seated and then we will take the bread together. After we have taken the bread, then we're going to pass out juice to those who have chosen to take the bread, and then we will take the juice together. All to the glory of God. So I'm going to pray, and after I've done praying, uh, you're invited to rise, come, and uh, take the elements. Please hold on to them again until we take them together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the death of Jesus who gave himself on our behalf. May we experience the reality of what that means this evening. We would ask in Jesus' name, amen. Abide the stand.
For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. If the servers would come forward, please. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. Jesus. 
Why is Good Friday good? Good Friday is good because the price we couldn't pay got paid and the stain we couldn't clean got clean. Good Friday is good because the world was without hope, but the lamb was without blemish. Good Friday is good because the worst thing that could ever happen was simultaneously the best thing that would ever happen. Good Friday is good because on that cross, on that day, the great shepherd of the sheep walked through the valley of the shadow of death for us. Good Friday is good because even though the cross isn't pretty, it's beautiful. Good Friday is good because if we have a king who would rather die for his enemies than kill them. Good Friday is good because I am not good, but he is. Good Friday is good, because Friday is not the end of the story. Amen. Indeed, Good Friday is not the end of the story. Thank you for joining us, and we ask that as you leave tonight, that uh, we leave silently in keeping with the somberness of the service, and we look forward to hopefully seeing you this Sunday as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. Go in peace.